woman reaches a certain age, when someone says to her, or her inner voice tells her, at your age, you wouldn't, you shouldn't, you can't do that. Well, here on a certain age, we talk to those amazing women who will, who can, and who do amazing things. I'm Lee Hayes, your host, and today my guest is Katherine Weber. Katherine Weber recently concluded her seventh year at the Richard L. Thomas Visiting Professor of Creative Writing at Kenyon College. She taught creative writing for eight years at Yale University and was an adjunct assistant professor in the graduate writing program at the School of Arts at Columbia University. She's taught at various international writing workshops from Paris to Mexico to the West Cork Literary Festival in Ireland in 2018. Catherine's described her style of writing as when the givens, the givens aren't what you thought they were. And having gotten to know Catherine, that description refers to a lot of aspects of her life as well as her writing. Welcome, Catherine. It's great to be here. Well, it's so nice to have you. And I'd like to start by revealing a little bit about you. So you have been a pro professor at some very prestigious universities, Yale, Columbia, Kenyon. Where did you get your degree? When, when an ordinary question with a non-ordinary answer, um, one would assume that I had a degree, indeed. I don't have a graduate degree. I don't have an undergraduate degree. Okay. Um, where'd you go to high school? Do you have a degree I, there? I um, didn't finish high school. I skipped 12th grade to go to college when I was 16. So I went to college. I went to the New School yeah. for Social Research. I actually went to Yale um, for five semesters, but I never finished a college degree. I got married young. I had kids. Um, and the same, the same day that I was not happy with a, a, a teaching assistant's comments on a paper I had written, I had an op-ed accepted by the New York Times. Oh. And it just made me feel that I was maybe writing for the wrong audience, um, if, teaching assistants. Um, and and I, I was ready to be in the world instead. And this is why, you know, you're, you're saying when the givens aren't what you thought they were, right? I would assume that you'd have multiple degrees. But so how did you get to Yale? Can we just look at there or how or Columbia or Kenyon? Right. What I think the short answer is I minted my own credentials. Okay. I I am a published novelist. Uh, I published my first novel, I published my second novel, I published my third novel. Those are my credentials for teaching. And I was actually asked to teach at Yale um, by someone in the English department there, a very imaginative, wonderful person, um, who knew my work. Uh, and I had taught only one semester before that um, at Connecticut College, actually. So I didn't have a lot of experience, um, but I actually am really good at it. I'm better now after, you know, 20 some years of teaching. I think I'm a much better teacher now. But um, creative work, whether you're a painter or a writer, is one of the few areas where your work is your credential at a certain level, at certain kinds of institutions. I could never teach at a community college without degrees. <laughs> I also could never get a job in a post office without a high school diploma, I think. But um, but you can teach at Yale. But I could teach at Yale and Columbia and, and Kenyon College with its, um, you know, legendary English department. Uh, so, yeah. So now, how did you get into writing? I mean, when I say get it, I know you did a lot of writing before you became a novelist. Was, Where did you start? I was a newspaper columnist uh, for the New Haven Register. I had a column on the break page of the Sunday paper, the living section, for a couple of years. I was writing book reviews, literary profiles, a lot of literary profiles for the Hartford Current, the New Haven Register, the late morning paper, the Journal Courier, um, Connecticut Magazine, Publishers Weekly, and I. I interviewed so many writers um, in complete bad faith because it was my excuse to go talk to them about writing. <laughs> so maybe that's one form of education, to be able to go and sit with Annie Dillard or Arthur Miller or Philip mm. Roth um, and talk to them about writing. And then, then I had to write the profiles, which I did, I think, very well. But for me, it was about the conversation. That's amazing. So, and, 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 you know, again, I in, invent the job you want and then apply for it. Uh, neither uh, Connecticut Magazine nor the Register had regular literary profiles um, until I made a point of a list of all the authors who live in Connecticut who um, you know would be you know A-list 
to, you know, to, to interview and write about when they have new work. And a they lot, of, a lot of writers live in Connecticut. It's near New York, but it's also, um, in the words of Philip Roth, um, sufficiently boring. Uh, and <laughs> and he, he talked, I think he quoted... Um, uh, Quoted a lot of writers at me. One of them said, um, "Live in a in an ordinary and bourgeois way uh, in your in your life, so that you may be violent and original in your work." And Connecticut allows for a lot of ordinary and bourgeois for a lot of writers. I love it. <laughs> so now I'm going to jump back to the newspaper. You'd mentioned that newspaper is killing content now, but I think it's also creating opportunity. Newspapers have changed so much since. I was doing that in the mid 80s. Uh, it, in the mid 80s, it was still like the mid 60s or the mid 50s um, compared to what it is now. And there were these in, these separate advertising inserts that would go into the paper, and um, that 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 was valuable. That was really valuable. And there was a lot of display advertising, and those created pages. And where there were what they called news holes, that's where the news would go. Uh, there were classified ads. There were stock market tables. All that stuff all gone has, has dwindled away to almost nothing. And um, you know, it's on the web. And so newspapers are skinnier and hungrier. And uh, there's a lot less display advertising. There are far fewer inserts. Um, and, and they so, don't staff so, writers the way they used to. No, right? A perfect example that I think is replicated nationwide. The New Haven Register was independently owned by the Jackson family. Mm -hmm. There was a food columnist. Um, actually, Mark Bittman, the famous Mark Bittman, was in the newsroom when I was there. I was writing a, sort of a, an opinion column. He was writing about food. Um, there were all kinds, you know, there was a theater critic. There were, there were all kinds of people providing local original content. And those people had pension plans and salaries. And if you dump them, um, and then you just buy something off the wire. You can you can you can have a, a food column for eight dollars in those days, as opposed to a, a, a living person. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it used to be that there was a stylist who would do the food shoots on Wednesdays. Uh, you know, it was a real newspaper, and it it, it became USA Today uh, when it was sold and consolidated and consolidated some more. Mm -hmm. A lot of regional papers have given up what made them regional, what made them you know local coverage, local reporters, original content. Um, now they grab it from and, the wire, and it's all very bland and similar, and it's all sort of the USA Today feeling. You know, when my first book was published in '95, there were so many book critics writing for newspapers, and there were so many independent book sections in those newspapers, mm -hmm. they're mostly gone. The New York Times Book Review is one of the only freestanding you know, publications within a newspaper. Washington Post Book World is now pages of the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's San Jose Mercury News, Chicago Tribune used to have a wonderful book section edited by um, Elizabeth Taylor, who's still there as a culture editor. But, you know, what used to be a freestanding section might be one or two reviews now that are just in the body of the paper. Um, so it's, it's changed a lot. Yeah, gosh, it has. But I think that's also where you got your big break, not in the yes. newspaper, but in journalism. Where was your big break? Well, How did you uh, several, rise to the top? Several big breaks. One was having a few pieces in the New York Times, and that was mm -hmm. just off what they call the slush pile, and then um, making a list of 100 topics for columns and going to the New Haven Register and getting the attention of a couple of editors and proposing a weekly column, which at the time I pitched as halfway between Irma Bombeck and Ellen Goodman. When the personal is political, when the political is personal, when when the universal is personal, when the personal is universal, um, and it was about a thousand words, um, and I it, and they they said yes, so it was original content um, of a type that I think would be very hard to place in a in a paper today, in a you know in a in any paper today, because what you would have instead is a blog or a website or something something for free out there, you know, on the internet, mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing, but it's a different thing. It's a different thing. But, but there was that. So it's like going to Las Vegas with one poker chip and then parlaying it and parlaying it. So the clips from this got me that. The clips from that got me the next thing. And then I was re reviewing and interviewing for Publishers Weekly. Um, you know, so having built from doing book reviews for $5 for the Hartford mm -hmm. Current. 
starting in 1976. Oh. <laughs> and then how did you turn from being a journalist to being a novelist. Where did that first novel yes. so come from? So I was working on a novel for a long time, but I had little kids. It was always lowest priority after filing the column, uh, making school lunches, you know, family life. But I was slowly, slowly working on a novel. And I sent a piece of it to The New Yorker um, in that naive way people send things to The New Yorker. And they took it. Wow. So my first fiction in print was in The New Yorker. So your break was your own guts, really, right? That you sent it. I mean, yep. you, said, you just said many people don't yep. take the step. And, and you... many people do, and it comes right back, rejected. Yeah. In those days, they were getting some 40,000 stories a year wow. submitted and publishing about 50. And now they get many, many more submissions, and they publish maybe 60 stories mm. a year. Um, it was it was a lucky break, but it was also a good story. Yeah. Um, but it was off the slush pile, and, and so, so that was it. So, so the they thing, took a piece. The thing that can't be done was done. You know, it would be as if you thought, I think I want to star in a Broadway play. I'll go to an audition, and then you're cast in the leading role. You know, it it, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't happen except every now and then it does. I've met a couple of other people who who had that break. Elizabeth Strout had her first story in The New Yorker. Um, Fantastic. It happens. Same editor, Dan Menneker. It happens, but it's rare. It's really rare. So, when you're writing a novel, is the world waiting for your novel? No, it is not. But if you're writing a novel and a piece of it has appeared in The New Yorker, the world is saying, the okay, who is this? It. Is there a novel? When can we see it? So, so what's your advice? You're talking so I, about so it if made you me, have... It made me finish the novel. It okay. made oh. it a priority. Okay. So, so there was that. And um, I just, I have to ask, how old were you when you finished your first novel? You published the first is, one. I, my first novel is my first novel. I, I have no discarded novels. Okay. Um, by the time it actually got published, it was published the year I turned 40. It was published in the spring, and in November I turned 40. So, um, so late bloomer. So, late bloomer. Yeah, and, and you've been cruising since then. But let me just ask you, what is some advice you might have for somebody? Everyone feels they have a story in them, or many people feel they have a story do. in them. A lot of people really, really wish they had written a novel, were writing a novel, had published a novel, but they can't get there from here. Mm -hmm. And I encounter that a lot. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't speak for everyone, but I do know that um, every single person who's ever published a first novel, written a novel, published it, was before that someone who had not written a novel, had not published a novel. So everybody starts off in the same place, mm -hmm. having no experience. And if you really, really want to write, you maybe aren't even sure is it a novel or a memoir, you're not sure what it is, but you have a story to tell, you, know, you have to give something up because something's not working in your current life because you have this intention but you're not doing it. So it requires a sacrifice and I'm not kidding when I say what the sacrifice is, which is that you have to give up not writing. Can you give up not writing? Okay, which, which almost seems logical, but I guess it's not. You're doing a lot of not, not writing, writing, a huge amount of not writing. Can you give that up? Because if you can give that up, then you can, you can write the novel. Find yourself the time. And if, when people say they have no time, do you have time to write? You may not have time to write a page a day. Do you have time mm -hmm. to write a sentence a day, a paragraph a day? Do you have time to plan on writing a, you know, half a page a day over a year or two? That's a novel. You know, right, I mean, right. you, you can't, no one can sit down and just write a novel. You can only write words and sentences and paragraphs and pages. And then those are chapters. Um, but there's, there's no one who's going to tell you, go now, do it. There are no staff novelist positions in business. Um, you, the only person who can give you permission to write a novel is yourself. And the only person who's keeping you from writing a novel is also yourself. Is yourself. So yeah. you just have to do it. Yeah. And the All MFA right. programs, a lot of people believe they need an MFA to publish a novel, to write a novel. And, you know, I think, I, you know, what can I say? John Updike and Edith Wharton um, didn't have MFAs. <laughs> uh, MFA is a new thing in the last few decades. And I think there are fine MFA programs. I think there are tremendous opportunities. I think you can learn a lot, and it gives you the time and space and dedication to writing fiction, sure. But it's not the only path. Mm -hmm. It's just not. 
And I think we live in a moment when it would be as if you can only ski with a ski instructor and you can only learn to ski with a ski instructor. Um, what about just put on the skis and go down the mountain and fall? So people um, should just pick up the pen or pick up the <laughs> yeah. keyboard, right? Yeah, I mean, and, there's nothing wrong writing. with taking lessons, but there's also nothing wrong with not taking lessons. Yeah, yeah. I love it, and you've done yeah. it, right? You are the, the embodiment of, I don't necessarily have the degree, right? You don't have the MFA, but you've written but I how teach many an how MFA many program. No, but you teach it. how <laughs> yes. many novels have you written I've, I've that have been published, I'm published, sorry, published? I've published every novel I've every written every novel right uh, my sixth novel came out about a year ago uh, and I've published seven books because the book before that was the one book of mine that's not a novel which is a family memoir mm -hmm. uh, called the memory of all that George Gershwin, K. Swift, and My Family's Legacy of Infidelities. All right, so, so we're going to jump to that. A story I had to tell. So we yes. need to jump to that because I love that story. So here we have the story of infidelity, a all true story. All kinds of infidelities, but that, actually. But that book is going all is is going places, right? So could yeah, you... there's a lot of interest. A lot there's of a, interest. There's a, a play going forward uh, by the playwright David Caudill called Duet for Three which is about the love triangle of my grandmother, my grandfather, and George Gershwin that, that um, was about a decade. Uh, and in that time period, my grandmother, a composer, wrote um, the score to the first hit Broadway show with music by a woman. Uh, and my grandfather, the banker, James Warburg, was her lyricist. So uh, they wrote that show when she'd been involved with George Gershwin for five years. She would continue to be involved with him. Um, for years more. My grandparents divorced finally after many years of this love triangle. Um, but uh, they wrote the show in a way both because of George Gershwin and despite George Gershwin. Uh, I've always thought it was a almost an attempt to save the marriage. The way some, some couples have a baby. Mm -hmm. I think my grandparents had a Broadway show. Wow. <laughs> But that's the heart of the story, uh, and I, it was it was a story I wanted to tell, and in, in, in psychoanalytic terms, to make a coherent narrative, mm -hmm. because we all have family stories pressing down on us from all sides, all sides, and what's so interesting when you delve is how inaccurate some of them are, or how some of them are the cover story for the other thing that really happened. Uh, and even if you just go into newspaper files, the internet is fantastic for this, you can find discrepancies in the way a story has been told and believed in a family. Um, all families have interesting stories. I, I admit that this one is particularly unusual and not, I was going to say, not everyone has a love triangle with George Gershwin. I think that's, that's true. That is that's a little true. bit unusual, but fantastic and what a great, I mean, so it's a memoir that reads like a novel, right? Because it's it's almost it's too many plots in that sense. <laughs> but my grandmother, Kay Swift, you know, was a wonderful woman. I'm named for her. I'm Catherine mm -hmm. Swift. Uh, she lived to be almost 96. My kids knew her, um, and and she really was a force. And um, it's in many ways um, part of keeping her legacy um, oh alive and and having her be better understood, better known uh, for her own musical contributions as well as you know as well as oh the woman who was George Gershwin's great love mm -hmm. you know she she was that and she was more and she was so. more. I love that that's wonderful so all right so now tell me about your most recent novel still, still life, life with, with monkey. monkey which is of course the title of um, any number of paintings by the French the Dutch the Italians from the 17th and 18th century, 19th century. Uh, there, it was a, a, a habit to paint a beautiful still life uh, with you know, fruit and flowers all arranged on a table and then marauding monkey, you know, helping himself to the fruit. And it, these were sort of moral allegories or just amusements. So I've always liked the title Still Life with Monkey because it's, it's some of this and some of that. But then for a novel about a quadriplegic who doesn't know if he wants to keep living and then he gets a helper monkey, it also has the meaning of it's still life, but it's also a still life, life because he has a C6 spinal cord injury and is right. a quadriplegic. Um, and then there's the monkey. And helper monkeys are a real thing and they're utterly fascinating um, creatures who have changed lives. Uh, I think they make they bond um, with their recipient, and they are truly helping hands. They can pick up a dropped remote or a phone. They can turn on a light switch. They can bring you a drink and put a straw in it and put the straw in your mouth. They can um, 
scratch an itch. There's a command for people who are tetraplegics. There's a, actually a command for this, which means you have independence and you don't have to ask someone to do it to for help you. you all the time. Right? It gives you privacy and independence. And then there's just this incredible bond with an animal, the way a seeing eye dog bonds. You know, with the recipient. I mean, it's a really, really important relationship. And capuchin monkeys are trained at Monkey College in Boston. <laughs> I have gone to Monkey College, not for training, but for observation. Okay. Um, I've spent a lot of time there behind the scenes at Monkey College. Uh, the method of training is essentially monkey see, monkey do. Uh, it takes years to train these monkeys, um, and then they are placed with recipients. But you uh, told they, me they that learn it's... 50, 60 word commands. They then learn specific commands for certain circumstances. Uh, and it's not legal in Connecticut. Yeah, I said not in Connecticut, but you said not legal in many states. It's 14 states don't permit helper monkeys on the grounds that they're exotics. They would consider it the same as if you had a crocodile or a gorilla. And I think that's misguided. I, I, I think it's political. I think there are reasons helpful for helpful crocodiles, it. yeah. Yes, a helper crocodile, you know. <laughs> Different kind of help. Not we don't need that kind of help. Plane. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm mocking helper animals because I think it's gotten out of control, and I think there are a lot of bogus helper animals mm -hmm. now. But these are highly trained. There's probably right. six figures of training go gone into these, into these monkeys, and they have a long life. Um, the helper monkey I know well, um, Farah, is 37 now. Oh, goodness. Um, she's All on right. her second placement. She's at the end, I would say. She's not going to have another placement. She probably won't live much longer. Mm -hmm. But in captivity, capuchin monkeys are long-lived. So um, many of them can do two placements, depending if, if they outlive the recipient or the recipient becomes too unwell for it to be a good mm -hmm. working relationship. But there's also a younger cohort now. It used to be people in wheelchairs because of MS or spinal cord injuries or things like that. There's a whole new group of recipients of helper monkeys who are young men who are veterans uh, of Afghanistan and Iraq and Desert Storm and you know where they they were blown up at the side of a road and they're in a wheelchair but they they're in a different place in their life and they they may not have spinal cord injuries they may have traumatic head injuries they may have lost legs but life with a helper monkey is is just something that makes all the difference for them. So and I'm a proselytizer. You can get that. It really interested <laughs> me as an element in a work of fiction. Sort of all the what ifs around around it. Right. Well, um, I had no idea that. I mean, helping veterans. I think if if they can do that, the other 16 states need to step up so yeah, we can help so our veterans. The organization is called Helping Hands, and um, they're in they're in Massachusetts. They're everywhere. So so reach my out. novel set in New Haven is definitely fiction because my primate institute in New Haven doesn't, doesn't exist, exist, but it's based on Monkey College in Boston. Um, and the whole story could not take place in New Haven because it's not legal in the state of Connecticut. Yeah, but but you said it's it's set here, and I understand that there's some awards yeah, looking well, at this novel I, it's, because it's, it's a Connecticut it's novel. It's been put on the on the short list for um, the Connecticut Book Award for Fiction. Uh, and also for the Connecticut Spirit Award, which is a new award that the Connecticut Center for the Book is giving, um, and it's one of three books nominated for that, where there's an emphasis on sense of place, on Connecticut as a setting or some aspect of the history of Connecticut. And Still Life with Monkey is very much a New Haven and Thimble Islands um, story. It, it, I mean, the, the, the environment is very much in the story. And now I think you said that so we, we have Connecticut sites and, and areas, we have the helper monkeys, and you bring all these aspects together, but you said even the quadriplegic was He's an, he's an architect in New Haven. But it was inspired by a real person. I, he was inspired by several people. By several people, okay. By several people, um, none of whom actually live in Connecticut. Right. Um, but you take all these aspects, absolutely. right, and just bring it's, them together. Yes, yes. It's, it's never, I've never ever written a novel about a person. Um, I'd say the only character in any of my six novels where I would freely say, yeah, it really is based on that, mm -hmm. is Farah the monkey. She really is the model for Adeline the monkey in Still Life with Monkey. I freely admit that. But for the most part, I wouldn't know how to write a novel if I was stuck with a character who really is exactly like some actual person. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't serve me well at all. Uh, it would get in the way of a story. Uh, I, I need to have a way of 
shaping the character to the situation, the situation to the character, and moving both of them forward, where even if I began with an inspiration of some situation that a real person was in, just in the act of creating the fiction, there's a kind of alchemy there where uh, it, it soon moves very far away from any original inspirations when it comes well, to real people. Well, you'd mentioned you were writing is reality adjacent. Yes. And is that exactly what you're talking <laughs> yes, about? Yes, it is, is reality adjacent. My, my um, previous novel to this is called True Confections, and it's about a, a crazy family with a candy business in New Haven um, called Zips Candies. It's been there um, since the 1920s. They're in fourth generation war over control of the factory. Completely completely fictional candy business, can't, fictional candy, real New Haven, real history of candy businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and then because I like to play with this, there's actually a commercial for Little Sammy's, the flagship candy that Zips Candies makes. It's on YouTube. I made a commercial. I made a commercial from the early 60s mm -hmm. from local television shot in a studio probably about like this you know it's it takes place in the novel and you can find the commercial on YouTube and it's a counterfeit it's fiction there's a website it, yeah. for Zips candies you can and try to order exist. the candies but it. they're back ordered <laughs> <laughs> back so, ordered forever yes, right? yes and I'm going to ask in our last minute <laughs> you mentioned you have to be receptive to be lucky yeah, Just sure. give us a couple words yeah, on that. I think you have to be willing to be lucky. You have to, you know, sure, I was lucky that my story was accepted at The New Yorker or, or, you know, any number of things. I was lucky that I was made the Richard L. Thomas Professor of Creative Writing at Kenyon when there were many other candidates with PhDs and MFAs who wanted that job. But you also have to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, I, I, it's, I think it's not really true that Benjamin Franklin went out in the rain with the kite and the key and the string, mm -hmm. but he was trying to be struck by lightning, right? He wasn't sitting, <laughs> sitting at home waiting to be struck by lightning. I, so I do think you have to um, be willing to be lucky and be willing to do everything you can to make your own mm -hmm. luck. But there's no age restriction. There's nobody who has to give you permission, uh, especially if it's when it comes to something like writing. You know, you, you're you just do it. So if you feel you have that story, like you said, the first step I think is just to write the first word. And you know, if writing email is what you do much more of than the the terrifying blank document on mm -hmm. your laptop, create an email account called you know. Su Susie Q's novel in progress at Gmail. You know, set, write yourself emails. Just start writing and then send them. Just send these fragments to that account. Don't even read them again. Just keep writing and sending. Because if writing email is something that comes right. more naturally to you in your day than, oh no, now I'm trying to write my novel, paralysis, then don't, don't, don't open a Word document. Send yourself emails. Describe the thing you'd be writing if only you could, but you can't because you're blocked, so you're writing this instead. And if I was writing, I'd be writing a scene about when the mother reveals to the son that in fact, you know, just describe the thing you mean to be writing. And and before you know it, you're actually You're actually writing. writing. I know, I love that. That is brilliant. <laughs> I don't think anyone ever said it. It's very they practical say, advice. It's, not right. it's yeah. very practical mm -hmm. advice. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's great. People need to, um, just start writing and write the emails. I, mean, I think I that's mean, wonderful. Waiting around for something to make you start writing your novel or your memoir or your book about your family, um, good luck with that. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So, well, thank you. You make it happen. You make, I love yeah. it. You make it happen regardless of your age. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for visiting My us pleasure. today, Catherine. We learned so much. Thanks.